It covers more ground than 22 nations, has a daytime population of 120,000, and is the result of a civilian and military partnership that is a model for military posts everywhere. Fort Benning has seven schools, a hotel, and its own fire and police departments. There are dog parks, car washes, three swimming pools, two libraries, a grocery store, and a shopping mall. In its century of existence, Fort Benning has trained more than a million soldiers from all over the world, including some of the most important military leaders in American history. Fort Benning is a training installation. It was born as a training installation. It's still a primary training installation now. That's its purpose, training. And when it was first born in 1918, it was formed as an infantry school. During the Spanish-American War, the Army set up a temporary camp on the banks of the Chattahoochee River near Columbus, Georgia. Local citizens welcomed the soldiers, who were bright-eyed with patriotic enthusiasm for the American cause and looking at the war as a kind of adventure. And all those soldiers needed food and recreation. There was economic stimulus generated from that, from having uh, this additional influx of population from people outside the region. Um, if loved ones came to visit them, that stimulated the economy as well. Camp Conrad was only in existence for a few months. When the Army left, there remained little proof that it had ever existed, except for the town's memory of the patriotic young soldiers and their paychecks. On April 2nd, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany. Congress overwhelmingly agreed. The American entry into the war was equal parts boast and challenge. The American military at the time was a barely potent regional force. All service branches combined had fewer than 180,000 personnel. The U.S. Army was only the 11th largest army in the world, smaller than the armies of Turkey and Bulgaria. When World War I began, it changed everything. They had to go instead of uh, you know, two lines of soldiers spreading out of skirmishers, instead they now had to learn how to do fire and maneuver, to cross no man's land and to fight in the open area beyond. The declaration of war instantly created an enormous need for training facilities. Just one day after President Wilson asked Congress to declare war against Germany, and four days before Congress agreed, the Columbus Chamber of Commerce passed a resolution inviting the War Department to build a large, modern training center on the former site of Camp Conrad. The resolution cited the camp's ideal location at the confluence of railroads headed in seven directions. There is no more healthful climate to be had anywhere, the resolution said, with an abundance of pure drinking water, perfect drainage, and everything that goes to make up an ideal camp for military purposes. All of which could be verified, the chamber said, by the brigade that had spent a few months camped out on the banks of the Chattahoochee River during the Spanish-American War. If you go out and you look at most military installations across the United States of America, they found their origins in some moment in history where that installation was required for a tactical need. If you go to Fort Riley, Kansas, that was in the fledgling days of a growing nation where we were expanding manifest destiny and we were securing the outskirts of this, of this young country. You go to West Point, and that was a key installation in the Revolutionary War. Well, what, what's particularly special or tactical about Fort Benning? Nothing. Why? Because the origins of Fort Benning was the idea and the, and, the, and the concept that came out of the Chamber of Commerce. In January 1918, Columbus presented a proposal for the lease of land to the U.S. government for the establishment of the School of Musketry. Options had been secured on 9,000 acres of land at $2 an acre. The county commission vowed to build access roads, and the Columbus Power Company offered to underwrite the cost of running power lines to the post. The plan called for just over 2,000 students and instructors to be housed and headquartered in 67 buildings at a total cost of $706,000. It took 10 months for Congress to pass legislation creating a training camp on the Georgia-Alabama border. During that time, the war to end all wars ground mercilessly along. Battles that started on horseback ended with tanks. The combination of evolving technology and obsolete doctrine created a slaughter unprecedented in world history. 
The public thought of World War I as the war to end all wars, but Congress and the War Department had no such illusions. They created the temporary post at Columbus, knowing the war would likely end before it could train its first soldier. The War Department named the outpost Camp Benning for Brigadier General Henry Louis Benning. A native of Columbus, Benning led Confederate troops into battle at Manassas and Antietam. He earned the nickname Old Rock after having two horses shot from under him at Chickamauga. When the Civil War ended, he returned home to practice law, and he's buried in Linwood Cemetery, just a few miles from the fort that would bear his name. In 1919, the Army purchased the former Bussey Plantation, Riverside, and moved the main cantonment to its present location south of Upatoy Creek. The plantation's main residence, which remains largely unchanged, is known as Quarters One and has been the home of every Fort Benning commanding general since its purchase. The enlarged Camp Benning covered roughly 115,000 acres, providing varied terrain for training. The cost of construction was just over $5 million. The first transfer of troops from Fort Sill, Oklahoma, arrived at Camp Benning in October 1918. They could not have been impressed by what they found. It was rough. This was a very dusty area uh, and a very muddy area. It depends on how bad it's raining. Uh, very hot and very cold in the winter because most of the soldiers did not even have buildings. They had to live in tents. Families of soldiers, they, had, they lived in tents too if they were lucky enough to get them. Like every other military installation in the post-war period, Camp Benning's existence was tenuous. There was never enough money for proper training. Buildings under construction languished through long delays. There is a legend that the camp was saved by the actions of a single construction quartermaster. That quartermaster apparently liked the rugged life at Camp Benning because when he received orders that he should salvage the camp's half-built buildings, he misunderstood, apparently deliberately. What they probably meant was to disassemble and salvage the wood. But the constructing quartermaster of Fort Benning, with the appropriate command allowances, looked it up in the dictionary and said salvage means to save. So he said to everybody, let's paint these buildings. The spruce up slowed the process and gave the camp more of a sense of permanence and bought time for Congress to consider the destiny of a post that had such strong local support. That's a, a sly way of kind of buying some time to where Congress would see that we're really committed and would maybe come around to saying, this is it, we're buying into Fort Benning. And that's what happened. Buy in or not, the newly designated fort remained primitive in the extreme. There was so little housing on post, one officer's wife advised newcomers to exaggerate the number of children in their families in hopes to increase their chances of being assigned something besides a tent to live in. Bring your own children to the interview, she said, and if you can, borrow a few more from your friends. We had come through World War I, and that was the war to end all wars. There was never going to be another war. So their soldiers on post focused on two things, building places for their families to live and fitness, which was interpreted fitness meant sports. Officers focused on polo, and their wives were expected to maintain a busy social schedule. Enlisted men spent as much time on construction projects as they did on training. In the background, however, the generation of officers that had lived through World War I, who weren't naive enough to believe that there would be no more wars, laid the groundwork that would make the American military the most potent fighting force in the world. While historically the Army in peacetime had shrunk into an ineffective and ill-equipped force, the National Defense Act of 1920 created the basic force structures that would remain to this day. It organized the Army into three distinct groups, the Standing Army, the National Guard, and the Organized Reserves. While acknowledging America's historic skepticism about large standing armies, it enabled the training and preservation of a skilled corps that could rapidly expand if needed. The act authorized more than 17,000 officers, three times the number authorized before World War I. That large number made it at least theoretically possible to expand the army quickly while leaving in place an experienced officer corps. 
To train the peacetime force, the Army modernized its training structure as well. The School of Musketry became the Infantry School. It moved from the relatively confined spaces of Fort Sill, Oklahoma, to Camp Benning, where there was room to train on a much larger and more realistic scale. It was established because of World War I. The infantry had suffered the most casualties, and it was deemed necessary that if they were not going to suffer that many in the future, that they needed a better place to train. The new type of warfare developing after the war required that infantry and armor work closely together. While most of the Army's armor stayed in Fort Meade, Maryland, the Army stood up the 15th Tank Battalion at Camp Benning. Its goal was not just to train, but to develop a new doctrine governing the developing mechanized force. In the 1920s, you have an automotive revolution. You have massive accomplishments happening in terms of technology. So you're able to build engines that are more reliable, suspension systems that can handle cross-country movement much easier. And as a result, people are beginning to look and say, you know, I can do more than simply keep pace with a walking foot soldier. In 1923, Camp Benning became Fort Benning. Now a permanent post, it remained amazingly primitive and kind of sleepy. In 1924, Brigadier General Bryant Wells put together a master plan for the post. The Wells Plan, as it is known, called for permanent construction of a campus-like environment. Wells envisioned landscaped gardens and, in the fort's developed areas, a close connection with nature. The Army, of course, had a ready supply of laborers, enlisted men who were put to work. They built sports facilities, including Doughboy Stadium, and quarters for their families. In 1925, construction started on the Quartel Barracks, getting hundreds of enlisted men out of tents. As the temporary post became more permanent, life settled into a comfortable norm. Soldiers trained, kids went to school, wives groomed and rode horses around the post, and the officers honed their polo skills. The fort and the town of Columbus fruitfully coexisted. There aren't many more important figures in the 20th century than George C. Marshall. He's well known for having served as Army Chief of Staff during World War II and Secretary of State in the war's aftermath. His Marshall Plan rebuilt Europe as a bulwark against the advance of communism. Why must the United States carry so great a load in helping Europe? The answer is simple. The United States is the only country in the world today which has the economic power and productivity to furnish the needed assistance. He won a claim for his planning of the Battle of Contigny, the first significant American victory of the war. But in 1927, as a young lieutenant colonel, Marshall took a decidedly unglamorous role of assistant commandant of the infantry school and his officers revolutionized infantry training, turning Fort Benning into the most important incubator of military talent in the world. He was shaped by the outcomes that, that he saw in World War I, the horror of casualties in World War I, and he was committed to not allowing that to happen again. And he wanted to get away from this idea that training for war was just rote uh, compliance with formation, formational movements, um, and instead that it is a profession that requires education and a thinking man's art. And, and he introduced that into the school. And so we can trace most of our professional military education back to George Marshall when he was here as a young officer. In what became known as the Benning Revolution, officers trained at Fort Benning were subject to an entirely different kind of training. Gone were the repetitive drills that dated back to the Revolutionary War. Instead, the infantry school subjected its students to deliberate stress designed to test their ability to function under fire. Marshall added unpredictability to their exercises. Maps with incomplete and even wrong information, sudden disappearances of entire units, breakdowns of equipment and weapon systems. He would put stress and change things because he wanted these leaders to understand that the enemy has a vote. You don't have all the information that you need to make decisions and lead in combat, and that you have to change and make those decisions yourself, not from a formal plan, for what you see right in front of you. It was a whole new kind of training, and it produced a whole new type of officer. 
Graduates of the infantry school could think on their feet in a way that earlier officers couldn't. They oriented toward an objective rather than pre-planned choreography of battle. They learned to build battle plans with flexibility for the unexpected. And when predictably the unpredictable things happened, they learned to act with confidence, quickly adjusting their tactics to best serve the mission. During the time that George Marshall was the assistant commandant at Fort Benning, what became the height of no money being spent by Congress on the military, immediately followed by the Great Depression. He said, well, we don't have much money to spend on weapons right now or on big training exercise, so let's develop our seed corn and make sure our leaders are ready for the future. In the decade before World War II, the war that was never going to be fought, more than 200 future generals passed through the infantry school as either students or faculty. We're not really sure if it's a true story or not, but the myth is that Marshall kept a little black book. And what he did is he wrote down who were the, the rising stars, who he could, he could depend on in the future. The list was a who's who of effective battlefield leadership. Dwight Eisenhower, George Patton, Bedell Smith, and Omar Bradley. For a world that was never going to go to war again, the 1930s were a time of incredible military innovation. All over the world, armies and air forces developed and deployed new technologies and doctrines. In 1932, the War Department combined the infantry and armor schools. The effect was an even more coordinated mechanized force and a lot more activity at Fort Benning. Also adding to the activity on post was the establishment of the Civilian Conservation Corps camps. The CCC was a government jobs program to fight unemployment in the Great Depression. All over the country, the Conservation Corps worked building lodges in national parks, carving roads and trails in national forests, and building public facilities that may or may not have been necessary. Working with other New Deal agencies, the Army undertook nearly $7 million of construction at Fort Benning. The work paid a dollar an hour for skilled laborers and 40 cents for unskilled. The post quartermasters overseeing the construction took pains to procure as much of the labor and materials locally so the economy of Columbus would benefit directly from the growth of the post. The sprawling infantry school building, now known as Ridgeway Hall, was built in 1935 at the center of the post. It was placed there as the bold embodiment of Fort Benning's rise. Once merely an encampment, then a temporary outpost, and finally a permanent but underfunded fort struggling to find its mission, the post that had started as a Chamber of Commerce development project was ready to assume a critical role in the greatest drama of the 20th century. World War II started years before the United States got involved. Though it was clear to many that American security would eventually be threatened by the rise of totalitarianism in both Europe and Asia, Americans had no desire to get involved in what the founders had referred to as foreign entanglements. Isolationism was not an option for the people of Fort Benning. As armies around the world tested and modified the theories and technologies they had developed after World War I, America's best military minds watched and learned. After seeing a demonstration of airborne troops in the Soviet Union, the Army stood up the Airborne Test Platoon, two officers and 48 enlisted men who volunteered to do what no American soldier had done before. Nobody wants to jump out of a perfectly good airplane, and it just takes guts to jump out of a 30-foot foot tower or to be hauled to the top of a 250-foot tower, and of course to jump out of a plane. You can't make that easy. You just got to do it. Take whatever is inside you and make it happen. The entire concept that we're going to be able to use first parachutes and later gliders to bring in entire divisions of troops behind enemy lines, that concept, testing, and doctrine is developed here at Fort Benning beginning in 1940. By the time the first paratroop boots hit the ground at Lawson Field, it was clear that the Army needed airborne troops just as it needed other forms of infantry the Army quickly built 250-foot jump towers. The original volunteers became full-time members of the newly formed 501st Parachute Infantry Battalion. 
and the United States had its first combat-ready airborne force. In 1940, the United States Army decides it's going to build a true armored force. They have seen what has happened uh, in Poland. That immediately gets the Army's attention because what's featuring prominently in all the press reports in the time is something called a Panzer Division. What follows then is a whole series of discussions about what we should do in terms of restructuring our tank and our mechanized cavalry force. General George Marshall, who had revolutionized infantry training at Fort Benning in the early 1930s, became Army Chief of Staff the same day Germany invaded Poland. He took command of an army that was rapidly expanding in anticipation of an American entry into the war. And, as he had almost a decade earlier, he immediately set out to change the way the army prepared for battle. Key to that training was a series of large-scale exercises that thrust huge forces from disparate posts into realistic battle situations based largely on the work of the 7th Cavalry Brigade. It was the Benning Revolution on a national scale. The Army established two armored divisions, the first at Fort Knox and the second at Fort Benning. Nicknamed the Hell on Wheels Division, the second had as its assistant commander Colonel George Patton. One of the young officers Marshall had noted while in charge of the infantry school. Five months after his assignment to the 2nd Armored, Patton received his first star. This is his opportunity to take tanks, scout vehicles, armored infantry, you know, infantry in half tracks, artillery, etc., and try to build the American armored force. He knew what was, if what was ahead had some idea of what was coming, and so he would uh, gather his soldiers out there at Sand Hill and the Harmony Church area to lecture them about the, the macabre nature of war, and it was one of his soldiers that referred to him as that old blood and guts, and it stuck. In 1940 and 1941, the Army held a series of exercises commonly referred to as the Louisiana Maneuvers. 400,000 soldiers organized into 19 divisions. Spread out over thousands of square miles, it was the largest military exercise in American history and a real-world test of all the Army thought it knew. It was a, a test of the Army's overall readiness for combat because by 1940, it was no longer a question of if we get into the war, it was when. The second thing it did was to serve as an acid test of the notion of massing large tank units together. Fighting for the Blue Force, Fort Benning's 2nd Armored launched a three-day, nearly 400-mile flanking maneuver into Texas. Patton's tankers moved so quickly, they overran the Red Army's 2nd Air Task Force headquarters, taking the entire staff prisoner. In November 1941, returning from Louisiana, Patton gathered his troops to give them grim notice. This is the last time, he said, you will fight with blank ammunition. The next time we meet, the bullets will be real. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. At Fort Benning, the experienced units, which for two years had been training in as real of conditions as any peacetime army could create, prepared for fast deployment. Overnight, life on the post changed. It was as if the world had sped up. Everything seemed more important, more immediate. Fort Benning had been created to train soldiers, and with the United States at last drawn into World War II, there were going to be hundreds of thousands of soldiers to train. Temporary quarters, known as 700 series barracks, were slapped up all over the post, intended to last only a few years, but destined to stay in use for half a century. In the town of Columbus, textile mills converted to make uniforms and tents. Local residents took in the families of soldiers and created recreational activities for boys away from home for the first time. 
There's an explosion of activity in the city of Columbus. Uh, you see even more than before the establishment of services for troops and for their loved ones. Uh, so you have the establishment of USOs, both for white troops and for African American troops. You also have numerous boarding houses that arise that are specifically targeted towards wives and mothers who are come to visit their loved ones who are stationed here. Volunteers poured in, young men flushed with patriotism and anger, willing but not yet ready to fight. Congress raised the draft eligible age to 45, so there were fathers with families come to train as well. The experienced units prepared to deploy around the world. The second armored division departed in three months for North Africa, where it faced off against German units with four years of combat experience. The 24th Infantry Regiment was one of the first African-American units to deploy, bound for the South Pacific. The 82nd Infantry went into a year of specialized training, absorbing other units from around the country. In August 1942, the 82nd Infantry became the 82nd Airborne, the all-American division with the motto, Death from the Skies. At its peak, the post housed nearly 100,000 officers and enlisted personnel. Uncounted thousands more passed through on the way to the European Theater of Operations. More than a decade of hard work from the Benning Revolution to the Louisiana Maneuvers was paying off. Just as Marshall had hoped, rigorously trained officers capable of improvising on a modern battlefield permeated the Army. They were followed by thousands upon thousands of new recruits trained using methods developed back in the days when the public imagined war to be a thing of the past. And back at home, the Post and the surrounding community came together to support the families separated by war, solidifying around the wives and children left behind. We were outgrowing our uh, facilities because so many soldiers were coming through Fort Benning, not only to train, but, but en route to, to Europe. The Army had about 270,000 soldiers before the war. At the time of the Japanese surrender, that number was 8.2 million. 318,000 soldiers and airmen died. More than a half million others were wounded. The Army before the war had 10 divisions and a mechanized brigade. By then, it was 91 divisions strong. What had been two armored divisions in 1941 became 16 by 1945. The infantry school graduated 59,000 second lieutenants. The fort trained more than 600,000 infantry soldiers and 118,000 paratroopers. Post hospitals treated 36,000 wounded a year, and 17 Fort Benning OCS graduates received the Medal of Honor. When the war in Europe ended, it was an old Fort Benning hand who stepped up to sign the German surrender documents. General Walter Bedell Smith, one of the young officers George Marshall had noted during the Benning Revolution, signed on behalf of the Anglo-American forces. On the other side of the world, it was Colonel Paul Tibbetts, a pilot who'd been stationed at Lawson Field on Fort Benning and who had married a Columbus girl who commanded the mission to drop the atom bomb on Hiroshima. The war ended nine days later. The terms and conditions upon which surrender of the Japanese Imperial forces is here to be given and accepted are contained in the instrument of surrender now before you. After the war, Fort Benning was one of the busiest mustering out centers in the country as the Army dropped from more than five million active duty to less than a million, as the United States considered how to build the right military for an atomic post-war world. Infantry seemed like a relic of the past. The GI Bill, passed during the closing months of the war, shifted spending priorities from defense to the service of veterans. The government paid for their college and subsidized the purchase of their first homes, leaving behind a shrunken military budget and the need to build a modern nuclear age force. There's a clear consensus across the board that combined arms organizations are the way to go. The problem is that once peace breaks out, other voices begin to be heard. Voices that say things like, yes, but combined arms is expensive. Combined arms makes training more complicated as opposed to if I have a pure infantry battalion or a pure tank battalion, much easier to do this. It's, much, it's, it's cheaper in a garrison environment, simpler to train. So let's do that 
and we'll come together in key training events and when we go into war. When the Army announced that it was transferring many of Fort Benning's functions to other posts, it did not sit well with the local Chamber of Commerce. Business leaders were concerned about the loss of personnel. Losing the OCS alone would mean the transfer of almost 10,000 people. Once again, the people from the town went to Washington to save their post. They were only modestly successful. The good news was that contrary to local rumor, Fort Benning was not going to close. The bad news was that the Army would go ahead with its reorganization, moving units and even the post's narrow-gauge railroad known as the Chattahoochee Choo Choo to other posts. For the sake of the economy, the Army combined the post headquarters, the infantry school, and the infantry center into a single command. The Air Force broke off from the Army as an independent service, and then recombined with the Army and the Navy into a unified Department of Defense. In the late 1940s, the outflow of veterans into civilian life stabilized, and Congress instituted a peacetime draft to provide the troops necessary for national defense. For the first time since the end of the war, the number of soldiers in tactical training units at Fort Benning increased. Columbus had always had a productive and supportive relationship with the Post, but Phoenix City across the border in Alabama was something of an evil twin. It had gone wet after the end of Prohibition while Columbus stayed dry. It earned its reputation as a place of sin, and locals referred to it as Sodom and Gomorrah. Our soldiers were regularly abused. Um, they would go over for a few drinks and end up tossed in jail, tossed in the river. That really did happen. Or beat up and all of their money was taken from them. The Secretary of State called Phoenix City the wickedest city in America. And local legend has it that Patton had threatened to flatten the whole town with his tanks. It got so bad that Albert Patterson, a crusading attorney running for attorney general on the promise to clean up Sin City was assassinated as he left his office. A jury later convicted a local deputy sheriff of the crime. A few weeks after the killing, the governor of Alabama declared martial law. In time, prosecutors handed down more than 700 indictments of corrupt law enforcement officers and elected officials and business owners with ties to organized crime. In June 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea. In August, the Army called up 62,000 reservists. In anticipation of casualties, the post hospital added 2,000 beds. And all of a sudden, the cry goes up, we need infantry, we need infantry leaders. And they had sent OCS away from Fort Benning, Officer Candidate School, away from Fort Benning, uh, out to Fort Riley, Kansas. And very quickly, they decided that they needed to bring it back to Fort Benning again and began to turn out uh, well-trained infantry officers to lead the fight over in Korea. The number of infantry school classes skyrocketed from 104 in 1950 to 247 a year later. In addition, the Army, which had deactivated its six Ranger battalions at the end of World War II, decided to bring back the Rangers. What they did is they stood up Ranger companies in Korea for the Korean War. The companies were created in South Korea after the war had begun, but they needed replacements and they also needed to get better training. So they created a Ranger course here in 1950 at Fort Benning. The first class of Benning trained Rangers graduated in November 1951. Two thirds of the graduates were assigned to units and shipped overseas. The others stayed at the fort to train the next group. Korea was a different kind of war. It was not a win-at-all-costs war the way the war against fascism had been. Nuclear weapons, the most powerful in the world, were considered too terrible to deploy. Korea was cold and mountainous and remote. Secretary of State Dean Acheson put it this way, if the best minds in the world had set out to find the worst possible location in the world to fight this damnable war, the unanimous choice would have been Korea. A year after it began, it bogged down into stalemate. Meanwhile, back at Fort Benning, the Post kept producing troops and caring for wounded. The town of Columbus continued to care for soldiers far from home as if they were native sons. Because the community uh, is so intimately connected with Fort Benning, uh, there's a, almost a seamless uh, symbiotic uh, relationship. 
The Korean War technically never ended. An armistice put an end to the fighting, but the state of war between North and South Korea remains to this day. President Eisenhower understood the disappointment of both the public and the military. He called the ceasefire unsatisfactory, but far better than to continue the bloody, dreary sacrifice of lives with no possible strictly military victory in sight. In 1948, Secretary of Defense James Forrestal and representatives of the Army, Navy, and Air Force hammered out what came to be known as the Key West Agreement. It defined the division of air assets between the military branches. With severe restraints on aircraft size and weight, the Army could maintain airplanes and helicopters for reconnaissance and medical evacuation. The Army started helicopter training soon after, but chafed under the agreement's prohibition against arming its aircraft. It seemed almost ridiculous that the United States Army would be unable to arm its aircraft. Brigadier General Carl Hutton, commandant of the aviation school at Fort Benning, put it years later, mobility was important, but armed aerial weapons platforms were more important. In 1953, the Defense Department lifted some of the weight restrictions on Army helicopters while maintaining a 5,000-pound limit on fixed-wing aircraft. For all intents and purposes, this put the Army on a helicopter-only path. The last Air Force assets moved off Fort Benning in 1955, and the Army created the Airborne and Army Aviation Department of the Infantry School. The central organizing principle of the time was the atomic battlefield, war that included tactical and strategic nuclear weapons. That necessitated larger numbers of support troops and few warriors at the tip of the spear. Doctrine shifted to smaller, dispersed forces that could function independently. The ability to move quickly around the battlefield became critical. Not surprisingly, the Army aviation emphasis in the 1950s was mobility. Officers thought of helicopters as airborne jeeps and focused development and training on getting infantry and airborne troops quickly from one place to another. In general, however, the 1950s were a quiet time at Fort Benning. President Eisenhower shrank the Army from a million and a half soldiers when he was elected in 1952 to under 900,000 when he left office in 1961. The major construction projects on the fort were the construction of the Fort Benning Officer Candidate School Hall of Fame and the Infantry Museum. The relationship between the post and Columbus flourished. More than 9,000 military families lived off post, intertwining the community and the fort. The commander of the infantry school attributed that close relationship to the fact that Fort Benning soldiers owned property in the town, attended local churches, played on local ball teams, and participated in scouting alongside the civilians. In 1959, more than 12,000 students from 38 nations passed through the infantry school. Fort Benning under George Marshall had once seated the whole of the United States Army with officers trained under the Benning Revolution. In the 1950s, it started to feed the armies of America's allies in the same way. We also have international military students from a number of our partner and coalition nations that also participate in the small group learning experience that we do here. You might find, for example, someone from one of the um, African nations sitting in class with us, someone from the Balkans, someone from South America, Central America. Exercise Swift Strike, the largest American military exercise since the Louisiana maneuvers, took place in 1961. The maneuver area covered 50,000 square miles in South and North Carolina. The 70,000 participating troops came from as far away as California to take part. In those years, soon after the Air Force and the Army separated, it was an uncomfortable joke that the branches hated each other as much as they hated the Soviets. One of the main reasons to hold swift strike was to test whether the bitter rivals could work together in near battlefield conditions. The Army saw the exercise as an opportunity to demonstrate its maximum independence from the Air Force. Fort Benning supplied aircraft, infantry, and rangers. Both the 82nd and the 101st Airborne Division, populated with graduates of Fort Benning, formed the main fighting forces, friendly and aggressor. While the Air Force provided the aircraft for the initial invasion jump, the Army followed up with its own tactical airlift, using fixed-wing caribou aircraft 
and a variety of helicopters, an entire division moved hundreds of miles to the battlefield in just over 24 hours. The exercise proved, according to the Department of Defense, that airborne troops can mount extremely fast and effective attacks and counterattacks. The next deployment from Fort Benning was not something that could have been predicted. In 1962, President Kennedy dispatched units of the 2nd Infantry Division to Oxford, Mississippi, the home of Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi. The Supreme Court had ordered the racial integration of the university. Local resistance was fierce and violent. Kennedy nationalized the Mississippi National Guard and dispatched soldiers from Fort Benning to provide security for James Meredith, the first African American to enroll at Ole Miss. The Fort Benning soldiers took control of the Oxford Town Square. It was, historians agreed, the bitterest clash between federal and state governments since the Civil War. Standing right in the middle of it, Fort Benning troops stood up to locals hurling rocks and bottles. They fired tear gas to disperse the crowd, but otherwise used no force. It was a model of professionalism and restraint, and their president acknowledged that without them there would have been much more bloodshed. In 1963, with 12,000 U.S. troops providing training and air support in Vietnam, the 2nd Division's 7th Cavalry introduced the Air Cavalry concept. Using cavalry tactics tracing back to Custer, the intent was to increase the infantry's reconnaissance and security capabilities. After that, the Army reactivated the 11th Airborne Division at Fort Benning. Renamed the 11th Air Assault Division, in its Organization Day ceremonies, it put on a stunning display of power, using four kinds of helicopters, including the new UH-1 Iroquois. The aircraft flew in low and fast, landing and deploying hundreds of soldiers in seconds. Brigadier General Harry Kennard, the 11th's commander, reviewed his troops, not on horseback or from a jeep, but from a helicopter. In his speech, he noted the proud heritage of this unit. We have, he said, the history and tradition of an illustrious fighting unit on which to model ourselves. They uh, created the first air cavalry division from these test units. And of course, that unit went into Vietnam in 1965, fought at the battles of Yao Drang. And of course, if you've seen the movie or read the book, We Were Soldiers Once, this is Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore and his 1st and 7th Cavalry as part of those troops. What is perhaps most interesting about Fort Benning during the Vietnam War is the way the community rose in support of the troops. Those were hard, divided times, and the nation as a whole didn't do a very good job of supporting the troops. I can't say that we weren't touched by that because we would have had to be blind to what was going on outside of those gates. But we, but again, we were here in the South where uh, folks were a little more, tended to be, to embrace the military a little more, more than say, maybe you might have found out on the West Coast. The families, meanwhile, are left at home having to uh, cope, having to readjust in our absence. Uh, that's a challenge in itself. Uh, and, then, and then we come home and they have to readjust as well. And we can sometimes be blind to that. Uh, so the, the challenges on the family really are, are difficult. Not long after the first units left Fort Benning for Vietnam, women at the post started the Waiting Wives Club. It was a social and support group for women whose husbands had gone off to war. Their goal was to make life as normal as possible for themselves and their children. But life on a post during wartime is not normal. The American force in Vietnam would eventually total more than a half million troops. As one of the Army's primary training posts, the pace of life accelerated. Thousands of new faces appeared on the streets of what had been a small, tightly knit community. At Benning, 1,300 draftees a week arrived for basic training. The paratroop school was busy working on new concepts of air mobility. Inevitably in wartime, bad news starts to arrive from the battlefield. The Army's policy was that notice of battlefield deaths would go out to loved ones by telegram, a process that struck the Waiting Wives Club as cold and impersonal. Julia Moore, whose husband, Colonel Hal Moore, had shipped out with the 1st Cavalry Division, was horrified seeing telegrams delivered by cab drivers. She and the Waiting Wives lobbied the Army to change the procedure. She said, this will never happen again. She changed the way we take care of families because of what was happening in the Vietnam War. As the soldiers of Fort Benning had so often changed the way the Army fought, 
the waiting wives changed the way the army dealt with families of the fallen the army formed casualty notification teams chaplains and officers dispatched not just to notify but to comfort they also made sure that a good crowd showed up for every military funeral in the area and raised money to help vietnamese orphans their steady hand on the home front made it easier for the deployed to do their difficult job. This is where the resiliency comes in, right? And so this is, uh, their strength is what um, allows us to do our job and, and, and while we're at work or while we are deployed, singularly focus on, on taking care of the soldiers uh, that we are responsible for, making sure that we are executing hard training, preparing them as best as we can to fight and win and then come home to their families. When we think of military technology, we tend to think of big, highly visible systems, jet aircraft, missiles, and far-reaching radar. Technology impacts the infantry in ways that aren't as glamorous as a supersonic jet, but that changes the battlefield just as much. Since 1919, the infantry board at Fort Benning had been in charge of research and development of new technologies to assist the foot soldier. In 1969, the board recognized its 50th anniversary. There wasn't a lot of time for celebration. The board, with its motto, the best for the finest, was busy testing and deploying a new generation of weapons and equipment for use in Vietnam. The tow missile being tested on the post provided unrivaled ability to destroy tanks. A new grenade launcher, lighter and with more range than existing launchers, would add punch in close battles. Night vision devices did what seemed impossible, giving individual soldiers the ability to see in darkness. And Project Linklow lightened the infantry's load by improving virtually every piece of equipment they carried, from lighter boots to more compact entrenchment tools. Like the infantry itself, the technology deployed after testing at Fort Benning wasn't sexy, but it did what it set out to do, and that's increase the mobility and impact of boots on the ground. As soon as systems were tested and proven, they were deployed to the men in the field. The worst times that I can remember in our country, toughest times, were in the Vietnam War because it became so, the atmosphere became so poisoned and Lyndon Johnson couldn't do anything, Congress couldn't do anything. We weren't fighting with the rules of engagement you need to fight with. We were only having a containment battle with the North Vietnamese, not a real winning battle. The war in Vietnam did not end the way other wars ended. Starting in 1969, the number of Americans in country dwindled from a high of more than 530,000 to, five years later, almost none. This was Vietnamization handing over combat responsibilities to the growing army of South Vietnam, as it had after every other war, as the American involvement in Vietnam waned, life at Fort Benning changed. Here at Fort Benning, uh, we focused on an awful lot of, of wonderful things that could come out of such a terrible, terrible time. We were the, the site of some of those airlifts, those final airlifts where we brought those orphans. It was actually a local lady bringing those orphans out of Saigon before it fell. In 1973, the draft ended. The transition to an all-volunteer force was critical to rebuilding the United States Army. As the Army's Director of Personnel Management put it, everybody in the Army wants to be in the Army. Everyone's volunteered to come in and be a part of something bigger than themselves. Fort Benning was one of three installations assigned to figure out how an all-volunteer army would work. The army set out to reform itself organizationally and culturally. It developed programs to make sure African-American soldiers would enjoy the same opportunities and benefits as whites. It dedicated $10 million to upgrade living conditions for both officers and enlisted men making service an attractive option for young families. Pay rates rose significantly, and most soldiers enjoyed a five-day work week. The Army even loosens its standards of hairstyles, mandating a neat but soldierly appearance, but making shaved heads a thing of the past. The infantry school streamlined, combining its two major commands into a single body known as the School Brigade. Fort Benning became the first Army post to move to entirely civilian KP, improving the quality of on-post food. While there were those who thought the change represented a softening of the forces, a government commissioned study indicated something very different, 
the all-volunteer force was making possible an entirely different kind of military. Far from weakening the United States, the RAND Corporation concluded the volunteer army was smarter, better educated, and more committed than the Vietnam era force. The improvements in pay and lifestyle dramatically increased the number of career personnel, increasing the proficiency and professionalism of the forces. That's important because the next generation of weapons systems were going to be technologically complex. Training would be long and exacting. High turnover rates would increase the cost of operations significantly. The period also marked an increase in opportunities available for women. Every year, it seemed, jobs that had been men only opened up to women. The 1970s and 80s were a comparatively quiet time. The United States managed to avoid major conflict. During that period, the generation of young officers that had been hardened in Vietnam rose to leadership. The Army replaced its main battle tank, its armored personnel carrier, and most of its artillery. It deployed improved rocket and anti-aircraft systems. It was a case of improved technology and an improved workforce meeting neatly in the middle. The Army that existed by the end of the 1980s was wildly different from the Army that had fought in Vietnam. It was different in large measure because of research, testing, and training done at Fort Benning. In the early morning hours of August 2nd, Iraqi armed forces, without provocation or warning, invaded a peaceful Kuwait. This aggression came just hours after Saddam Hussein specifically assured numerous countries in the area that there would be no invasion. You could sense the Pentagon holding its breath and hoping that nothing else would happen because that organization had virtually zero, very minimal anti-tank defenses. Without an armored force of your own, you're seriously hampered trying to cope with a hostile mechanized force. It wasn't a topic of conversation at the time, but what became known as Operation Desert Storm was the first large-scale test of the new all-volunteer army. Three commanders with strong ties to Benning led that army. General Colin Powell, of course, was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. The commander of the force in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait was General Norman Schwarzkopf who had written the definitive paper on advanced training tactics after studying the infantry school's methods. And General Barry McCaffrey, commander of the 24th Infantry Division, was a Ranger graduate and had served as assistant commandant of the infantry school. Determined not to repeat the mistakes of Vietnam, they settled on a strategy of overwhelming force and fast movement. The term maneuver warfare was new to most civilians, but not to those who had studied at Fort Benning. Tanks and infantry moved with perfect coordination, protected from above by aviators from every branch of the service. The attack was fast and lethal and seemed at times to be coming from all directions at once. The Iraqis were stunned into immobility, and the few who tried to escape back to Baghdad became targets on the notorious highway of death. The war took 100 hours. American forces suffered fewer than 800 casualties. The Iraqi army was decimated, with more than 100,000 dead and as many as 300,000 wounded. The American forces returned to a hero's welcome the veterans of Vietnam had not enjoyed. In the mid-1990s, units from Fort Benning served peacekeeping duties in Bosnia and Somalia. The Post won awards as the best large army installation in the world and the President's Quality Award recognizing commitment to excellence in federal government. Fort Benning also provided relief for victims of Hurricane Andrew and stood up for democracy in Haiti after a military coup. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. Before orders arrived from the Pentagon, the 23,000 troops of Fort Benning shifted to a wartime footing. As Omar Bradley had done after Pearl Harbor, Post Commander Major General John Lemoyne secured the post. The sudden isolation of Fort Benning from Columbus disrupted things. Three weeks after the attacks on New York and Washington, American special forces in Afghanistan struck back, and the United States found itself in a new kind of war. 
As American troops fought all over the world to dismantle terrorist networks before they could attack, the Army reorganized. The location of the center was no accident. In 2005, the Base Realignment and Closure Committee, charged with identifying military facilities that were no longer necessary, weighed the strengths and weaknesses of various posts. Confronted with the possible loss of Fort Benning, Columbus Civic leaders once again stepped up. We again pulled together the right people. We tried to make sure we could fix as much of that, meaning make sure that we didn't have any logical uh, demerits, if you will, of why we would be singled out. And we made the pitch that Columbus and Fort Benning are symbiotic. We've been a great um, marriage of communities for such a long time. You ought to consider more being here versus less. People see Fort Benning here as part of the community. It's not a segregated part of um, our city as it is in, m in many other military installations. The BRAC decided to move the armor school to Fort Benning in 2011, making it possible for infantry and armor to train the way they fought together. It's oftentimes not understood that we really do spend a lot of energy and the senior leadership spends a lot of energy here contemplating what are our future requirements. What, what needs to change today so that tomorrow we can be more successful on the battlefield? It is the same process the Army has gone through at Fort Benning since George Marshall figured out a better way to train infantry before World War II. Women in the United States Armed Forces have a long and storied history. Traditionally, opportunities in how they serve have been limited to non-combat roles, if available at all. But in the 21st century, the Army has a plan to integrate women into previously closed military occupational specialties. That plan is called Soldier 2020, and once again, Fort Benning is leading the way. Here at Fort Benning, as part of Soldier 2020, what we're doing is integrating women into the infantry and the armor. And we know how to train soldiers here at Fort Benning. We've been doing it for 100 years. We know what it requires to have a trained and capable soldier. And so when we put a soldier through ranger school, if we put a soldier through um, basic training, it's about ranger, ranger, ranger. Are you a ranger or are you not? Are you a soldier or are you not? Have you met the standards or, or have you not? And as long as you meet the training standards, and anybody would expect that this would be what we would want for our army, we want you to be in, into the formation and fight. The future to many looks a lot like science fiction with battlefields occupied primarily by robots wielding artificial intelligence the way cavalry once wielded sabers. Fort Benning is now leading the way in trying to imagine how technology will change the future battlefield. Warfare is distinctly a human endeavor. What we have to be careful of is not make the mistake to presume that warfare will be replaced by, by robots. It will be aided by robots. But in the end, um, you know, any autonomous system, when it fails, the next target is the human center of gravity. Because the issue is not between robots. The issue is between peoples. It's a uniquely human behavior. So humans will always be part of this. Boots on the ground will always be fundamental in any campaign, and we, we can't forget that. From horse cavalry to battlefield robots, from a chamber of commerce dream to a national security reality, from 1918 to 2018. A city and a military base forever intertwined. For the past century, Fort Benning has been on the front lines of America's national security dominance. It has stood magnificently through the good times and bad, through American triumphs and American despair. As Fort Benning enters its second century on the Chattahoochee, its mission remains clear, to provide America with the best trained and best armed fighting force the world has ever known. Fort Benning is the meat that holds the whole sandwich together in terms of the United States military capabilities. You can't win wars and win battles and win hearts and win minds without boots on the ground. Airplanes are great to get the boots there, but the boots have got to be on the ground. Ships are great to get them there, but the boots have got to be on the ground. And Fort Benning is the training center of the boots of the United States Army. It is a center of excellence for our country, and it's a great contributor to the peace of the world.